uh, Michael Howe, VP of Product Marketing. In this segment today, I'm introducing Network RPA. We, we, we announced it last week at Onug Spring, and we showed the first public demonstrations of it. And it was, it's really exciting from the whole, we call ourselves the Glue Crew. We are talking about bad uh, work company names. Um, I kind of like ours, the Glue Crew. Uh, incredibly proud of the team that has delivered this solution. It's been in the works for quite a long time. And it's that getting to that, what Ernest was talking about in the intro, a no code automation ability to get to very quick, the building of the automation. I think what everyone agrees automation is great. And I think where the, the challenge is, is that, that building of it, like how long does it take to build? And if the, if the how long it takes to build and to develop and you have limited folks who have that skill set, it's really gonna limit that agility to respond to the business needs. So let's, let's jump right into it. So for those not that familiar with the Glueware platform, I'm gonna frame it a little differently than Ernest did in the fact that, you know, Glueware um, is a suite of applications that are what we call out of the box, right? You get the app suite like you would with Office 365 or the Adobe suite, where you have your device manager, Drift and Audit, OS manager, dashboard. So you get, you have this suite of applications that deliver you some type of automation functionality. And there, there's kind of purpose built around that, right? Where obviously, um, if you think drift or audit, those are pretty self-explanatory. In our device manager, we interrogate devices and provide very detailed inventory information. We discover the network and we, we do a bunch of things in that app, but I think it's kind of, some things are a little self-evident, right? In terms of what we do. So on top of that out of the box suite, an important component here, and you'll see it in the third demo today, is something we call Glueware Lab. And Glueware Lab is a really important part of the component, especially for folks in this room and attending that say, you know, Glueware, it's great. You have things pre-built, but I'm different. My network is different. I have different devices. I have customization. You know, uh, we have, we have a, a different data store. As soon as customization comes into the conversation or maybe the product suite not meeting the requirement out of the box, it, you go into that realm of how do we customize and how do we do it quickly? Well, Glueware Lab has been uh, released to our, our customer base um, over a year and a half ago, and it, it is the kind of DevOps for NetOp approach, which means there is some low coding, but you get to build custom network features, introduce custom abstractions, you can do custom API integrations, and it's really a cornerstone of what we've delivered uh, in our platform because it is that customization piece. And in demo number three, you're going to see how, how nicely it ties into network RPA. So getting to kind of the heart of this conversation, this presentation is network RPA. And one of the first things uh, I want to convey with it uh, is that we you probably run into this in your careers where you feel like you need to automate the automation. How many have kind of seen that? Like, oh, you know, well, I can automate. Well, here's a task and here's a task. Well, I want task A to run and task B to run, but then I want to talk to ServiceNow or I want to talk to Jira or I need an API call. And, and so it gets into the, the really what is the orchestration challenge. And this is why Network RPA was built. Number one, it's the automate the automation. And one of the, the great things about Gluer is because we already have a suite of underlying apps, Network RPA is the orchestration on top of all of those. So you can execute a drift and then an audit and then a provision. And then you can, you know, if you can layer in your conditions. If drift occurred, reprovision the device, right? And uh, you can get to just so many use cases around move ad changes, troubleshooting, even what I'm most excited about, it, there's a lot of things that this, this brings us into, is that Gluer can start to automate things outside the domain that we've been focused on. We're focused on that network infrastructure, the CLI, API, cloud, but there's so many other things in the management plane, right? Like maybe even just submitting a new DNS entry or, you know, just, numerous things that you have to do as a network network operations person that aren't necessarily a change on a router, right? There's this tremendous amount of tasks and uh, things that you'd want to automate in a process. And then one kind of directional thing that, you know, we want to convey to the marketplace is that this is setting us up extremely well to get to AI and ML driven capabilities. We're doing the work now, we've hired in a VP of AI and uh, we're, uh, we're doing the things that we need to on the underlying side to, to uh, handle the data and be able to, to then take machine learning algorithms on that data 
to then assist operations engineers in their job. And uh, I can't get into too much now, but stay tuned because Blueware has a lot of exciting things coming up in our near future. Speaking right after me also is our VP of security that we brought in, a security expert, um, you know, really a renowned person in the field. And we're gonna be really expanding what we do directly around security. So uh, we'll, we'll, more on that. So let's set up the demo. I wanna just frame your, your mind a little bit more around when we talk automation and orchestration, you know, this kind of comes from my work within the ONUG in our ONA working group is that there's what we consider an ONA layer, right? The ONA layer automates southbound to the networking domains. So we kind of consider them the CLI domains, kind of your traditional networking, your API domains could be direct API to devices or API controllers, and then cloud. And cloud is generally automated through API primarily. We've looked at AWS as CLI and it's pretty terrible, right? So it's pretty much all API oriented, but it's built for that. On the northbound side, this is where process automation really comes into play because like Ernest was talking about in the financial uh, space, everything needs to be documented into an ITSM or you have you know, integrated syslogging and monitoring and IPAMs that you need to automate with. And so the orchestra- Sorry, quick, quick, yeah. I'm not, the term I'm not familiar, acronym I'm not familiar with, ONA. Later. O ONA, yeah, orchestration and automation. Okay. Yeah, it, I, I used to always say, you know, just the automation layer. When we formed the working group in ONUG at the end of 2019, the, the belief was that the orchestration was the, the gap in the marketplace, that there's actually a lot of automation solutions and there's a lot of, there's, you know, there's kind of broad based automation technologies, but was really kind of missing was orchestration. Yeah, I just never heard yeah. that. Yeah, no, I appreciate you, you bringing that up because again, I have ITSM on there and Syslog, you know, most networking, most of these are networking, IPAM, IP address manager, right? That sort of thing. So what we want to move towards is, Ernest talked about it, that we built towards this before that this term has really been maturing. Now, quite a, quite a few organizations are kind of getting around what this term means, but it's this notion of applying that CICD pipeline to net ops. So where you build your automation, you have the ability to test it, you deploy it to production, you operate it, you monitor it, and you iterate. And that's the key that I like when I talk to customers is, you, you know, you want to start out with the kind of simpler automation, get those things automated, and then you increment and you add complexity and, and then you layer in more complex variable management and, and the things that make automation harder, right? But you want to get through this cycle and take more of an agile approach where you're you have the ability to step and repeat and you're not stuck in the build cycle for months because maybe you're teaching yourself Python or trying to grab some script you found on the internet and you're trying to make that work. There's just a lot of t time and cycles. So let's get into the two demos I'm gonna show. First, I'm gonna show general, just what does it look like to build in Network RPA? The second I'm gonna show you is something that <clears throat> I found that is just kind of uh, something engineers are probably doing every day with Glueware. Glueware speaks API to Cisco and we speak API to NIST. And from it, we pull, Cisco, we pull a bunch of things. We have about eight APIs we interact with, but one of them is we pull P-cert data, uh, advisories that they've issued on their products. And we speak to NIST for the multi-vendor side of it, which are called CVEs. And so through Glueware, uh, we're taking your inventory data, referring it to that. And then we tell you how many, the count of how many critical or you know, um, high, medium, low type, type vulnerabilities. And so what we're gonna be doing is just showing how we're gonna be leveraging the fact that we're already pulling that data. And then we have a workflow that's gonna go and look at that data and just say, if I have any criticals, if I'm greater than one critical, I need notification. And in this case, you know, Glueware has become a big JIRA shop. We're gonna open a, a, an issue on a JIRA board, right? Because now a human needs to get involved because we have critical issues. Because now I need to figure out, is it an OS upgrade? Is it config workaround? So, um, so that's the piece that we're gonna tie in there. So, so I'm logging into Glueware. And as I mentioned, you know, um, I didn't talk a lot about it, but it can be installed on-prem, run from cloud. It's a multi-engine architecture, which means that um, the, the scale or the power of Glueware just depends on how much you compute you allocate to it. And it can be, it supports being a, a distributed system. So we have already customers in the you know, 20,000 node range, 50,000 node range, and customers down in the you know, two and 300 node range. So pretty broad based from, from a scale perspective. Um, I wanted to, to start out by, you know, just, you know, navigating into our dashboard and 
as a user, you, you navigate in and you, you kind of work through the apps. So if I just look at my inventory here and what I would do, like I was talking about, is I would go through and look at my device or look at my accounts or drift and audit. And, you know, here's your app suite. So we're going to jump right into Network RPA into the workflow library. And one of the first things I want to call out to you is you look at there's already a series of workflows that are built here in the development. Um, the, uh, these are in a test or production. We've integrated in that, that notion of moving through test and production. And so what I wanna just show you is a little bit of what building looks like. So we'll go new workflow. And then you indicate, is it public? Is it private? I'll make it public. And then, so this is tied to our back in terms of uh, who has access to the workflows as well as access level. So five different levels. You may have operational workflows and more change oriented workflows that you could, you could create those things. Hit next. And just basically it's dropping you into canvas that's drag and drop. And when you're in your drag and drop canvas, you have glueware tasks, which are again, built off our native app suite. And then you have third party tasks and we'll get into how to add even custom tasks. So let me just build this out real quick on, I'm going to, uh, we're working on top of the inventory or I already have or, or other third party endpoints. So I'm gonna filter my targets. I'm, I'm going to execute a, a new config capture on all my targets. We leverage that new capture to then perform a drift, which is we're comparing the snapshot to you know, a known good uh, compare. And then we are, um, we are going to run an audit as well, right? So I just dragged and drop a, se a series of things in. Let me make sure I drop it on the right point here. And so very simple drag and drop. Now let's get into you know, layering it in a little bit. I'm gonna add a rule to filter on the name. The name contains And one thing about filtering, which is powerful, is if you add devices that meet that criteria, they get added into the next time that thing runs. So you're not having to maintain a static list. You certainly can do a, a, a static selection of targets. Let me hit save. Sorry, my WebEx, sorry, Zoom windows on top of my UI. So it's, all right, so that one's done. These two don't need configuration. On my audit policy, I'm gonna choose the policy and I'm just as pulling from my underlying audit app. I have a Cisco standard config policy and I hit save. Oh, I didn't hit save. And, and that, is, that is configured. So we're exposing a form fill with the minimum kind of inputs you need from the user and, and you're set. Now it gets a little more fun or interesting because now I wanna add some logic. So after I execute my compare, I want to set a condition, if then else. If my device property, and I, was, I got a, I'm going to add a rule where um, I'm looking at drift. So I'm looking at config drift. Again, there's lots of parameters. If, if config drift equals no, I'm going to continue down the path. Else, configs have drift, drifted. Okay. Now, <clears throat> now I want to say if, it has drifted, I actually want to execute what we call provisioning, which is with these devices, I already know when I'm setting this up, we're managing the configurations and we, we will restore them to good state. We, we're not script driven, we are intent based and declarative. We know the policies on each one of the, uh, the config elements that you're um, managing with Glueware. We're gonna examine what's on those devices and then only add or move or change what needs to be changed. So if, if nothing needs to be changed, we don't do anything. If someone deleted a QoS statement, we'll know exactly the statement that we need to add and the engine understands order and operation. So like Ernest was saying, highly reliable and you get the same thing every time you run it, which is a term called item potent. Every time you run it, you get the same result. So I, I also could layer a notification for the sake of time, I, I won't do that, but, um, and let me see if I, yeah, I mean, I layer in email, uh, I can layer in Slack or something like that. Once I'm happy with my workflow, save it. And then now we, we go through the validation st stage. Okay, so in the validation stage, you run the test. When you run a test, 
we, we're pointing to devices. In the Gluer inventory now, you can indicate if devices are test only, production only, or a combination. You may just have devices where I'm gonna call them just, you know, and, and my, I happen to do both in mind because I'm gonna use the same devices for my, my testing and my so-called production in my demo. So I run the test, I execute it, and I go to activity, and it navigates me over into my workflow activity. And you can see uh, the progress and, and hit the log and you get, some, you get some task level logging. And let me close that. And then up on this side, you're gonna see it <clears throat> run through it. So it, it looked at my whole inventory and based on my filter, there was five devices that met that. It's capturing the configs, it's comparing the configs and it's gonna go through that logic, right? Well, when I navigate into targets, because Glueware is using our native stack to talk down to these devices, you have full visibility all the way down to the CLI interaction or API interaction with the devices. So <clears throat> I can see in this, uh, as Glueware, as the Glueware engine ran, it pulled the, it pulled the entire config and everything it's doing. So very deep level of logging. And, and this particular workflow completed in 33 seconds. Okay, so, so sorry. Yeah, I mean, I please. I have limited time, but I got a billion questions. Yeah, please. This is great. Um, but one thing you just said about you could use CLI versus API, like let's say that I want to use an API yeah. um, for some things because the device supports it. And in other cases, perhaps that version of the code doesn't support it. How, where in this process do I choose that this particular function is going to use an API and how that API response is parsed because you get yeah. into yeah. that kind of interaction. So um, you don't have to answer that question right now, but I'm very interested yeah. in, in how that works at a mechanical level. Yeah. So I'll just touch on it so you get uh, at least some understanding is that it really breaks down into are the APIs southbound, meaning network no, device oriented uh, APIs, or are they non-network devices like potentially ServiceNow or something like that? And so you're going to see those, those API interactions. But basically, when it comes to the network side, if we're talking to a controller, Glueware onboards, uh, we onboard the vendor, and then we understand the, cement, the, 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 the set of API calls that we need for discovery and the set of API calls that, that we require for change. And then for when you're doing config change, so for example, then you're doing discovery, it's kind of transparent to you. Glueware already has a whole set of API gets that are, are pulling that data through API. On the, on the config side, uh, Glueware config modeling kind of abstracts and gives you form fills that feed into the API. So underlying, maybe we're doing a post to do an update, right? That's the mechanism. And we're looking at a return variable or something. But on, on the goal on the, the at least the, the network side is Glueware is abstracting and taking care of as much as that, of that as we can. So that's on the Glueware onboarded APIs. Then there's APIs that you can onboard yourself or kind of fairly custom. And demo three, you'll see some of that. Okay. So didn't exactly hit the hit the yeah. mark for what I was looking for, but we can take it up there. Are, are you asking about how you choose between CLI and API? Yeah, like so. For example, let's say I hate myself and I wanted to do like mm -hmm. you know rest conf on an iOS XC device. Sure. And I, and I wanted to you know say, well, this is the path that I want to use to set something up. You know, versus maybe that that version of code doesn't support rest conf for a particular command that I want to do. So at some point, I'm going to have a widget that says. I want to affect a change on this device. And that particular change might be, I want to use RESCOMP for sure. I want to use CLI. So, so just, just kind of piggybacking yeah. off that, I and mean, not every organization is capable, is, is going to have the ability to run up-to-date hardware and up-to-date software that supports all of that. So if I got some old 3560s running 12 dot code, how, how do I do yeah. that? How do I say so, you know, use so, that old yeah. device, but it still needs from a code standpoint, when you're doing configuration management with Glueware, when we inventory the device, we capture the, the version of code it's running. So then when we're configuring configuration managing it, we can have constraints in there. Like if this iOS equals this or greater, we're using these command sets. And, and if we go to provision a device, um, meaning make a config change on it, and it's got an older version of code than that, that we've said has to be the minimum, that, that job will fail because it, it didn't meet the prereq uh, constraint of that operating system version. So, so, so that you're, you're con semantically version relationships, like this well, version is older than this version, this is younger than this version, like semantically? Well, we know the version because we're, we're doing a show version, yeah. right? We're capturing it. And then in the config side, 
you know, users are generally implementing the constraints. So we give you the ability to add the constraint of a minimum required operating system version. And so that would be the constraint. And so we, we, our engine would know, yeah, um, based on version number, if it's lower or higher than that minimum version. Yeah. We add a device for CLI. Yeah, so that the API to CLI thing. So, yeah, well, I think we need it because the API and CLI thing is a big is a big thing. I think what you're going to see, and, and you're going to see in this next demo here. But this is just to drive home your question. When when we're onboarding the the, the, the device into the system, we, we choose whether it wants to be API or CLI. And then let's say you want an exception, you can build that exception up into the individual RPA task. So let's say you normally handle this via API, but you have one exception you want, you can create a task specifically for that exception. Yeah, I mean, just again, like case in point, like, I, let's say I have a Arista shop, you know, and I have Arista devices, and I want to use the yep. API to interact with the device, but maybe this one command right. says, you know, yeah, yeah, not supported for this yeah. command. Like, I was curious how that's handled, but I don't want to rabbit. Yeah, it yeah, I know because it is a big topic, and I appreciate you giving us the out to not. But uh, what I would just quickly say is that if if it's been onboarded and supported operating system, then we support it pretty robustly. If we haven't supported it yet, like for example, Arista via API is not a a vendor supported interface yet at this point. Something we're layering in, you could add a tactical API call to do something specific, and, and I'll I'll give you an example in this particular uh, workflow. We're adding an API call to Jira. However, um, we're leveraging Glueware's onboarded StackStorm as a third-party library, and it gave us 150 plus integrations. So you're gonna see it in this demo as well as the security demo where we're making a tactical um, task-based automation. In this case, open a Jira ticket. You're gonna see in Tim's, Tim's demo, you're gonna see uh, update an ACL on AWS. So if there was uh, an API call you needed to make to a vendor and it wasn't like, let's say full-blown configuration management, but you needed a programmatic way to implement a change or a variable that could be implemented like right away and, and via various mechanisms. Maybe there's a third-party library, maybe we build in, in Glueware natively and you're gonna see that in the third demo. So with that, um, as far as onboarding devices, just pick on F5. Like if you had an F5 and it wasn't, well, actually I guess you guys just covered Arista. If it's not a supported device, can I still import it as far as like the that selection process that you talked about? So you didn't pull all the rich information, yeah. but I manually, hey, this is this device, this is how I want it tagged. Can you can you kind of manually import things? Yeah, I'm, well, I'd have to kind of parse out that question a little bit because um, essentially with the Glueer suite of applications like inventory, drift, audit we need the vendor adapter in place. So in the case of, um, of F5, we do have the vendor adapter. And so we would speak to it and, and shouldn't be an issue. Um, if, there, if a vendor adapter wasn't there, then you wouldn't necessarily have the full Glueware suite. Like you may not be able to drift it and audit it, but with network RPA, you could hook, hook in a task-based change, be it, be it whatever. And that's, that's the power of, in, in the second demo here, you're gonna see where we're calling Ansible because maybe in your environment, you have a mechanism to make that change. And maybe it's through a third party automation system. Well, now Glueware Network RPA can orchestrate that. So in our view, it's better. Obviously there's more advantages if you can do things through the native Glueware stack, because then it's idempotent, it's declarative, and you have the suite of applications that you support it. When you're firing off something third party, and I had this experience with StackStorm. Some packs are great, some aren't that great, right? And, and some work functionally or tactically, others don't. So that, that's, that becomes the decision-making when you're, when you're building the automation. The, yeah, go ahead, sir. And that's, that's really what I was kind of, uh, trying to get to was for the stuff that's, that's integrated, that's awesome. Yeah. But I mean, more than likely, everybody's gonna have that one edge case where yep. I've got this one thing. And if I can, even though it's not, Ready. If I can still use the platform to manage it, it's I'm building more myself. Absolutely. But the platform is still that you know that, yeah. that tool that does it. And this is a great example because in this case, uh, I'm using StackStorm to open a Azure issue. So I'm leveraging this third-party library, and they had a call I needed, and it's doing technically what I want. But it's not exactly what I want. So I may use it now, but then I may iterate that use case. And I, I may build the API calls natively in Glueware to handle it. And I think mm -hmm. that's generally where we are 
let's say steering customers is that if you can use something third party and it works for you, great, because we'll wrap around it and orchestrate it. But because we can onboard things natively and then wrap Glueware's intelligence around the API, effectively making us still item potent and declarative, but now operating through an API interface, we can still do the read and the write and the verification and, and, the, and the programmatic interaction because, and this is good experience that we had through ONUG. We're doing programmatic interaction with Microsoft Sentinel and with an operate a observability product called Kentech. And the integration is a web hook, right? It's very, it's, it's very, you know, fire this off and, and execute it, right? A web hook is kind of that bare minimum of programmatic interaction, like tell something what to do and just do it. What you really want in programmatic interaction, especially through APIs, is you want to be able to programmatically interact with it intelligently and handle variables and handle more advanced cases. Because basically in webhook style, if it works, it's great. If it doesn't work, you're kind of that, it just didn't work and then now you're, so you want things more robust and more resilient. So, so. quick quick comment, I'm, I'm the enterprise architect. I've spent a lot of time around RPA solutions. I'm confused yeah. as to how okay. this RPA yeah. Yeah. and the automate anywhere, the UI path yes. sense. That's a RPA. great question. So yes. I'm, yeah. just, I'm so completely yeah. Let, I'll address that right now because I think it's a great question. And when I, you know, educate our sales team and everything, it's like we are not going into the, the actual RPA marketplace. We are network RPA. We're taking some of the best things that RPA is doing about bot kind of bot-based programmatic things that are repeatable that you can build very quickly. We're taking the approach of so-called RPA, but we're trying to apply it towards network infrastructure. And the other piece of that is that we already had a, we already have a, a first generation product that we have called workflows. Those workflows had to be pre-built, then they go into your workflow library and you execute them. But we're taking, we're introducing a next generation of workflow capability where it's no code drag and drop, build your own kind of so-called bot-based approach or these automated processes. So we are not in, we are not entering the, the, the RPA market with UI path and automation anywhere. We are focused on the network automation and trying to apply those things. And network RPA was our, our way of trying to create something interesting in the marketplace from a, a branding standpoint. Yeah, good one. So again, with this one, a really simple, uh, we're, we're filtering our targets. We're saying if, we have any critical advisories, fire off or open up a JIRA ticket on, uh, sorry, issue on a board and also email notification. So it's really, really simple. And if I just navigate, if I cancel out of here and just navigate back to my, my list of workflows that are in my library, when I fire off and this one's in production, I hit, I hit run, execute, and it says go to activity. This one completed in four seconds. I just want to highlight, you might not be able to see this, but this is an automated task that may take me, you know, 20, 30 minutes if I'm navigating around. Like if it's a user task and you have to interrupt your day to kind of go do a vulnerability assessment based on vendor information from Cisco and NIST, um, you know, I would rather this run and then tell me if I need to pay attention. You know what I mean? Like draw my attention to it because it needs, uh, it needs attention versus that. So if I navigate over to my board, um, I just opened this uh, critical advisory detected workflow. So kind of quick and dirty demo in that sense, but we wanted to highlight the fact that we're using a StackStorm integration. So it's not necessarily Glueware Intelligent Automation, but we're orchestrating a third party. And through StackStorm, we have 160 plus integrations to tap into. And, and it's great to implement some of those tactical automations to get them done quickly in that net DevOps approach. The, I think it was your presentation. You had the like the test drive page. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, I presume we could basically just go out there, fire up the test drive, and kind of dig through, poke through some of the stuff that's out there, just to kind of get a better understanding of what the what the options are. And, and Absolutely. Are. You get the full app suite, except Network RPA, because it releases. <laughs> uh, it releases supposed to really end of next week somewhere, and it's we're within a week or two of of actual release. Once the re release goes out, test drive will be incremented and you'll have that as well. 